Good evening, Charles. Good evening, Charles. Yes, good evening, Stratton. Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening. Okay, welcome on board. We have now five participants on board. Mm -hmm. You to the time constant, I think we can start and others will join later. Okay, fine. So good evening, everyone. Welcome on this revision class for management accounting. We will have Charles Omanyo, the experienced director for this course. And I hope everyone will get something tangible for this revision. So without taking much time, let us give floor to Charles for the presentation and discussion. Welcome, Charles. Thank you so much, Stratton. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this discussion. Maybe we'll start by the rules of, of the meeting. I thank the ICPA for organizing such a revision session. And I hope my screen is visible. Stratton, maybe before you leave, is the screen visible? Yes, it's well visible. Okay, fine. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks for organizing such a revision session. So I'll be guiding you through management accounting CAT, that is S3.2. I've taught it for quite a while since its inception, since it started. I've been 
teaching management accounting in both CAT and CPA, of course, and other related units. So today we'll be going through, we have two sessions. The first session is today, which is of course Monday. It will be a four hour session today and uh, actually three hours and some minutes because 20 minutes are, is, is gone because we were just waiting for our numbers to increase. So, but because time has gone, we will just start. So we'll have a session today and we'll also have another four hour session on Thursday. So I'll divide today's sessions session into two parts. I'll overview what you really need to do between now and exams. What should you do during exams room? How should you prepare for exams? All that I'll take approximately 20 minutes to cover. And then the remaining part of the session are approximately three hours. I'll use to revise some few questions from the most commonly tested topics. So the first 20 minutes is just an overview. What should you do when you have an exam paper? How should you manage your time ETC? So that is what you want to do. So it's going to have two phases. The first phase, phase, which is 20 minutes or so, we'll be looking at that overview. And then later on, we will start revising questions over the remaining hours today. And also on Thursday when we meet, we'll also have session, some revision questions. So what is the objective of the session? The objective is to provide necessary exams tips to help you in planning and time management for exams. How should you tackle questions in exams? How do you extract data from case studies that you are provided? How do you know the right data in case studies? And what are the practice exam techniques? And finally, we are trying to make links between different topics that are tested in exams or topics that are in management accounting. So our main focus is how do we plan? How do we manage our time? How do we tackle questions in exams and also revise some common areas that are tested in management accounting exams? So that is the objective of these two sessions today and on Thursday. Now, we will start by looking at exams. S3.2 is a three-hour paper. This paper has got three sections. This is normally the instructions that you receive when you get the S3.2 exams paper. These instructions are normally provided in the first page. So S3.2 is a three-hour paper. The three-hour paper has got three sections. Please let's listen carefully so that you know how to tackle the questions. So there is section A, there is section B, and there is section C. Section A of your exams has got 10 questions. The 10 questions are multiple choice questions, which means the 10 questions you have been given options, or if I call them answers, but let's call them options. So there is question one, you have been asked maybe which one of the following is a characteristic of service costing. I'm just guessing any question there. And then you are given four answers. It's you to choose which is the best answer. So that is section A has got 10 multiple choice questions of two marks each. So 10 questions times two marks, that's 20% in exams. Section B has got two questions. And the two questions, each of those two questions has got 10 marks. So 10 times two, that is 20. So that means section A accounts for 20% of the exams and section B also accounts for 20% of the exams. So the remaining 60 marks to make it 100 are in section C. Section C has got three questions. Each question is worth 20 marks. Now, in management accounting as 3.2, there is no option. All questions are compulsory. You must attempt all questions. So let me go back to section A. In section A, they are multiple choice questions. In section A, the examiner is only interested in your answer. So if answer is A, you calculate it in rough paper somewhere or at the back of at the back of your answer booklet, and then you just write in the first page, question one, answer is A. Question two, answer is this. Workings will not earn you mark in section A. Let me be very clear. Workings will not earn you any mark in section 
A. So the first 10 questions, they are multiple choice questions. So either the answer you have chosen is right or it is wrong. But section B and C, you must show all your workings. All workings must be shown in section B and section C. Now in section A, I always advise you to write all your answers in the first page, all answers. But from section B and C, every question should start in a new page. I'm repeating. Section A, all answers in one page. Question one, question two, until question 10. That is for section A. For section B and C, start each question in a new page in exams. I hope the instructions are clear. Now, how do you read the questions and understand them? The exam questions. You must read the questions very carefully and identify the instructional verbs used. You must understand what are the terms that have been used. Have they asked you to explain or have they asked you to list or have they asked you to compare and contrast? You must understand the verbs that the examiner has used. Remember, there may be more than one question, more than one question to answer within each requirement. So there can be one requirement, but in that one requirement, there is more than one question. So always ensure you read a requirement at least twice, at least two times, so that you understand what the question actually asks. You must use the mark allocation to work out on how much depth you need to go into your answer. So the marks will guide you on what is the volume of your writing. So for example, if a question has got one mark, it means you should not give detailed explanation. But if a question has got 10 marks or five marks, it means detailed explanations can can be shown. So make sure that you are answering the question set and not that you would like to answer. You know, there are some people who, who cram and then they go to exams with whatever they had mastered or they have crammed and they want to answer whatever they have crammed instead of answering what the examiner asked. So ensure you are answering the question you have been asked, not answering what you know. Whatever you know, you must align it to what has been asked. Now, what are some of the tips you should consider when answering questions? You will be expected to manipulate numerical information using techniques learned, and also, more importantly, you will need to interpret the information. So for example, you have been given a case study with the financial statements of a company. So in this financial statement, you are being asked to analyze the financial performance of the business. You should know that from the knowledge you have, financial performance is analyzed by use of ratios. So you don't only calculate the ratios, you don't only calculate the ratios, but you also interpret and analyze the ratios you have calculated and explain to the examiner what does the change in the ratio mean? That is just an example. Knowledge provided by analytical review of this information is key for managers to make what? Decisions. Remember management accounts are accounts that are prepared to help managers in their decision making. So knowledge of this paper will enable you as a manager to make sound or good decisions. So that is the basis. That is the objective of this paper. To enable you as a manager, they are assuming you are maybe a manager. You are trying to make objective decisions. Should we open a new branch or should we not open a new branch? Should we, have, should we close an existing branch or should we continue operating an existing branch? So you are trying to make decisions. Or you are trying to provide some data to the manager to enable him make informed decisions. Now, how do you plan for the exams? Please, in the time management, it's very critical in this paper. 
you must know how to manage your time. So I've given you examples here. Section A carries 10 questions. And each question is two marks. So that means it's a total of 20 marks. So in section A, don't take more than 30 minutes in answering section A. I'm repeating, don't take more than 30 minutes in answering section A. Actually, averagely, you should take 1.5 minutes per question in section A. 1.5 to 1.6 minutes per question in section A. So if you find you have taken two minutes or three minutes in a question, let's talk of, not in a question, I mean marks. If a question has got two marks, one question, two marks, don't take more than three minutes to answer the question, which means each question has got two marks. So which means each question, the average time you should take is three minutes because I was talking of 1.5 minutes per mark. 1.5 minutes per mark. So if one question has got two marks, you should take averagely three minutes to tackle one question in section A. So in section A, the total time you should take is 30 minutes. Section B also has got 20 marks, but section B, it is more detailed compared to section A. So in section B, don't take more than 40 minutes. In other words, you should allocate 20 minutes per question. So when you are doing a question, you should be having a watch to compare the time you are taking to tackle a question, to look at the time it takes you to answer each question. Now there is the section C. Under section C, there are 20 max questions and there are three questions. So take averagely 30 minutes per question in section C. In section C, take averagely 30 minutes per question. In other words, section C should take you 90 minutes or one and a half hours. So remember, the exam is three hours. Out of the three hours, one and a half hours, you should dedicate it to section C. 40 minutes, you should dedicate it to section B. And 30 minutes to section C. So that gives you a total of 90 minutes plus 40, that is 130. 130 plus 30, that gives you 160 minutes. If you manage your time that way, you will still be remaining with at least 20 minutes to review everything you have done. So there will be 20 minutes extra to enable you review the work you have done. Remember in management accounting, you are pressured with time. Time is not enough. So allocate your time appropriately. Section A, we have said, take only 30 minutes. If you take more than 30 minutes, you know you will run out of time. In section B, take averagely 40 minutes, 20 minutes per question because there are two questions worth 10 marks each. In section C, take averagely 90 minutes. In other words, 30 minutes per question, 30 minutes per question. Now, that is, we have said, if you follow that, you will be remaining with 20 minutes to enable you to review what, what should be done. You'll be remaining with 20 minutes to enable you to review the entire work that is remaining. Now, how do you manage your time effectively and identify easy marks which are available in exams? There will be easy marks available in all sections and students who answer these questions first usually perform well. So make sure in section A, answer the questions in order. But in section B, you must not follow the order because there are two questions. You can start with the one you feel is easier for you. 
in section B. So if you find the first question, that is question number 11 is easier for you. Question number 11 is the first question in section B. If you find question number 11 is easier, start with question 11 in section B. If you find question 12 is easier, start with the easiest question. Because the easiest question, you will take fewer minutes and you will earn more marks. Same to section C. In section C, also start with the one that is easiest for you. At the end of the day, you must do all of them, but you start with the one that you feel it is easier for you. That is point number one. Students who do not manage their time and miss easy marks make it even harder for them to pass the exams. So if you cannot maximize your marks on the questions you feel are easy, remember the easiness of a question depends on a student. Maybe topic of variances can be easy to somebody, but very difficult to another person. So the how easy or hard a paper is, is individual affair. You must make sure that you are using your exams time effectively to identify any questions that you can easily tackle and plan the order in which you will answer the question. So section B has got question 11 and 12, 10 marks each. Section C has got question 13, 14, and 15. So you can decide that I want to start section C with question number 15. It doesn't matter. It is only in section A that you should list the questions in order. What are some of the common mistakes that students make? Number one, lack of ability to interpret the calculations performed. You have calculated ratios, maybe profitability ratios, liquidity ratios, ETC, but once you have calculated them, that is just one step. The next step is to try to interpret what you have calculated. So most students lack the knowledge and ability to interpret whatever they have calculated. Number two, poor interpretation of data. Sometimes, yes, you have the data, but you are giving what? Poor interpretation. For example, the question has asked you to use AVCO method of stock valuation. And you, you decide to use FIFO method of stock valuation because that is maybe the only method you know. Number three, poor technical knowledge and failure to closely read the question. You don't have that technical capacity, capability to answer question. So you may fail as a result of that. Number four, not enough practice of past paper what? Questions. Ensure you practice all S3.2 past paper questions. I'm repeating. Because there are not very many, ensure you revise all of them. There are about, I think, four or six papers. Ensure you revise all of them, all, before you go for exams, including... July 2022 past paper. Make sure you revise all and you are conversant with each of them. Reason being, the examiner will be unique in every sitting. The examiner will not repeat his questions. So ensure you revise all questions in the past paper of S3.2. Finally, make sure that you are always thinking about the pitfalls. In other words, mistakes during the revision and each time you practice a question, you are thoroughly reviewing your answers afterwards to identify if you need to work on any of these what areas. So make sure you are always thinking about those mistakes that people make so that yourself, you will not be in a position. We should learn from the mistakes of others. Don't be part of the mistake. So ensure you learn from the mistakes of others. Now, which are the topics in S3.2? I know in the textbook, there are 12 topics, but I've summarized them into nine topics. There are topics I've combined together. Please, when revising, ensure you understand everything in each of these topics. Everything that can be tested, because we have seen all questions are compulsory. So you don't have that liberty to choose a question to do and to leave out another. 
you must do all questions. So what are some of the topics in S3.2 as I wind up on this first phase? Number one, there is sources of data. You must know the different sources of data, be it primary data or secondary data, internal data or external data, discrete data or continuous data, so long as it's a source of data. You must also know what we call sampling techniques. Data is normally collected by what we call a sample. So there are two methods of sampling. There is what we call probability sampling and non-probability sampling. So you must know all that. And also that is in sources of data. There is now cost classification and cost behavior. You must know the different ways to classify costs. Costs can be classified by their nature, by their function, by their elements, by their behavior, by their controllability, by their avoidances, can also be classified as relevant and non-relevant costs. In other words, classification of costs by decision making. We have cost estimation and overhead treatment. How do we account for our overheads? There are three steps followed when you are accounting for overheads. But before I look at costs, I will finish. Sorry, let me go back to cost classification. In cost classification and behavior, so there is also what we call coding. You know, when you are collecting data, you normally collect them through a sample. So sometimes you need also to code your property. You need to code your assets in the business. How do we properly do the coding? That is covered also in cost classification. Now, cost estimation. What is a cost estimation? Cost estimation is just the process of trying to predict the cost incurred, trying to anticipate the cost that was will be incurred. That is cost estimation. So there are different methods of cost estimation, but your examiner normally concentrates on two methods of cost estimation. They concentrate on the high-low method of cost estimation and regression analysis method of cost estimation. Overhead treatment. Remember, overheads are indirect costs. So how do we account for indirect costs? There are three steps we normally follow when accounting for indirect costs. The first step is called allocation and apportionment. Second step is called reapportionment. And the third step is called overhead absorption. So you must know how to account for overheads using those three steps. Number four, budgeting. Budgeting is basically just a quantitative plan of action prepared in advance of the period to which it relates. I'm just trying to do a quick summary and then we go to past paper questions. So budgeting is basically a, a quantitative plan of action prepared in advance of the period to which it relates. Now in budgeting, what do you need to know? What are the reasons for budgeting? Reasons for budgeting. There are about eight reasons in your books. Eight reasons for budgeting. Budgeting helps in planning for the future, control of costs, authorization of expenditure, communication of targets. I'm just trying to quote, quote those ones that you know from your notes. There is, but there is also what we call approaches in budgeting. What are the approaches in budgeting? Top-down budget, bottom-up budget, zero-based budget, incremental budget, activity-based budget, ETC. So in budgeting also, we have what we call functional budgets. Here is where we have sales budget, production budgets, material usage budget, materials purchase budget, labor rate budget, labor efficiency budget. So those are under budgeting. And then finally, you must also know how to prepare what we call fixed budget and flexible budgets. Fixed budgets and flexible budgets. And finally, you must also know how to prepare a cash budget. How to prepare a cash budget. The next chapter is called forecasting. Forecasting is related to budgeting. 
That is forecasting. Now in forecasting, what do we look at in forecasting? Here is where we look at what we call time series analysis. Time series analysis is a, just a, a series of figures recorded over a period of time. We also have index numbers in this case. Index numbers, etc. Correlation, etc. There is the decision making. Now in decision making, how do we make decisions when we don't have enough resources? So that is called decision making when we don't have enough resources. We call it decision making in a limiting factor environment. Decision making in a limiting factor environment. We also have what we call investment appraisal under decision making. What about investment appraisal? How do we appraise our investments? How do we evaluate our investments? That is under investment appraisal. You can use a technique known as net present value. You can use a technique known as payback method. You can use a technique known as accounting rate of return method. Accounting rate of return methods. Chapter seven, we have standard costing and variance analysis. Standard costing and variance analysis. So under standard costing, a standard is basically a planned unit cost of a product or a service. A planned unit cost of a product or a service. Now standard costs are normally calculated by preparing what we call a standard cost card. A standard cost Card. A standard cost card is just basically a document that shows the standard cost of one product. We also have what we call variances or variance analysis. So under variance analysis, we have different types of variances you should know, and also factors to consider before you investigate a variance. What are some of the factors to be considered? Controllability of the variance, interdependence between the variances, the cost effectiveness of a variance, ETC. We also have we also have what we call variances, types of variances, sales variance, materials variance, ETC. We also have performance measurement and cost management. So performance measurement and cost management, these are two topics, I've combined them into one. Performance measurements, performance measurement is actually defined as a measure of how somebody or something is doing in relation to a plan. A measure of how somebody or something is doing in relation to a plan. That is performance measurement. Cost Sorry for that. I have strong internet, but there is some breaking. I really don't know what the challenge is. Can you hear me? Can any one person unmute to confirm if you have the right to, or you type in the chat, in the questions and answers? In the questions and answers, can you hear me?
can you hear what i'm saying so a hand means you can hear me let me hope so okay sorry for that interruption i hope it will not occur again because i i i have maybe there is a problem with liquid telecom because it shows the network is full but i don't know what is not happening okay fine let's continue So before I lost the network, I was there. So I was there. Please, I'm saying this is very important. This one will enable you to revise. If you want to revise effectively, you just look at this slide. ICPA will share with you these slides. So that when you want to revise a certain topic, you just go to the right past paper and revise the question from it. So let's look at this, this breakdown. So the columns are the settings in which the exams were done. The rows are the past the topics from which the questions were tested. Remember, multiple choice questions are random. Multiple choice questions are from the entire syllabus, from the whole syllabus. So let's look at December 2020, for example. Section B, question one, or question number 11, the question was on evaluating accounting systems. Question number 12 was on cash budget. I'm on December 2020. Question number 13 was on flexed budgets and variance calculations. Flexed budgets and variance calculation. Question 14 was on a balance scorecard. Question number 15 was on absorption costing and also activity-based costing. In April 2021, they tested on functional budgets. Question 11. Question 12, they tested on financial and non-financial performance. Question number 13, they tested on variance analysis. Question number 14, they tested on financial and non-financial performance. Question number 15, they tested on limiting factor. In August 2021, question number 11, they tested on relevant costs and discounted cash flows. That is NPV. Question number... 12, they tested on evaluating accounting systems. Question number 13, they tested on activity-based costing. Activity-based costing. So I'm also trying to note down the questions. So activity-based costing, question number 13. Question number 14, they tested on ratios. Question number 15, they tested on limiting factors. So you can see question number 15 in both April 2021 and August 2021, they had tested on limiting factors. So they had tested on limiting factors. So there was April 2021 and there was also August 2021. In December 2021, they looked at multiple choice questions, of course. Question number 11 was theory on stock valuation method, FIFO and LIFO. They also, question number 12, they tested on flexed budget and variance theory. Question number 13, they tested on CVP analysis, charts and formulas. Question number 14, they tested on ratios. Question number 15, they tested on activity-based costing and responsibility centers. We are almost there. April 2022, question number one to 10, multiple choice questions. Question number 11, variances. And which variances? Material price variance, material usage variance, fixed overhead variance, of course, fixed overhead expenditure variance, and fixed overhead ex volume efficiency variance. Question number 12, they tested on functional budgets. Question number 13, they tested on financial performance measurement by use of ratios. Question number 14, they tested theory part on budgeting. Question number 15, they tested the balance scorecard and operational and planning variances. August 2022. 
Question number one to 10 was multiple choice questions. Question number 11 was cost estimation, high, low, and then also differences between marginal costing and absorption costing and advantages of marginal costing and disadvantages of absorption costing. Question number 12 was on steps followed in budgeting and the approaches to budgeting. What are the different approaches to budgeting? There was also a CVP. There was capital investment appraisal. There was fixed and flexed by budgets. And there was also variances. That tells you there is a very high chance from budgeting of having a question on functional budgets and cash budget. There is a very high chance of having a question on functional, but there was functional budget question in August 2022 theory part, the, sorry, section A part. So you must know how to prepare functional budgets and also how to prepare cash budget. Variances can still be repeated. So you must know how to calculate all variances, not some. Limiting factors was also not tested. So there is a very high chance of having a question on limiting factors. Balance score was also not tested. There is a very high chance of having a balance scorecard question. Balance scorecard questions. So please note, and of course, regression analysis, regression analysis has got also a high probability of being tested. So that's the end of my first phase. My first part of revision was to guide you, especially how do you tackle questions? What are the questions that have been tested? How do you revise? What is the time you should allocate for each question or for each mark? We have said in section A, 30 minutes. Section B, 40 minutes. Section C, 90 minutes. Total that you give, you will still have some time at the end to enable you practice more questions. Any question on that? Okay, so I want us now to move forward, move a step forward, and now my grade two, tackling questions. How do you tackle questions? Now, the remaining time, we are now remaining with approximately three hours. The three hours we are remaining with, we want to use it to manage our questions effectively. But I'm just giving you five minutes. Please listen to the rules. Five minutes just to stretch out of your seat and then five minutes, strictly five minutes. Don't take more, but don't log out. And then we come and restart. Strictly five minutes. I'm counting, don't log out. Five minutes as we prepare for the second phase. Again, later on, I'll give you a 10 minutes break. But for now, just have five minutes. I hope we are together. So just stretch out of your seat and then you come back, but don't log out for five minutes. So we are restarting again at 1808. 1808. 1808. Unless there is a question in that first phase, I believe in the first phase, we have understood what was needed of us. What can you see in the screen? Okay, although it's a break, it's a break. After the break, we'll, I'll ask the question.
Okay, we are back. We can continue now. I'm there. I'm trying to solve some technicality here. Just a response in the chat. Can you see the Excel sheet I'm trying to share? Just a response in the chat. Excel sheet, can you see it? Chat, please. Questions and answers. Excel sheet, can you see it? I'm asking a question. Can you see the Excel sheet? I'm not asking whether you are seeing it well or we are seeing it badly. Is it, can you see the Excel sheet? That is what I'm asking. The rest I'll work on. I'll work on the size. Don't worry about the size. The question I'm asking, are you seeing it? Okay, fine. Now, I hope you have your past papers with you because this can only be successful if you have your past papers. Now, in section A, I'll divide my session into two areas. For today, one hour or so, I, I'll take in section A. Remember in section A, questions cannot be repeated. That's why I don't want to concentrate much of attention in section A, but I'd rather just guide you on how to answer, and then we move to section B. So let's start with section A. I've chosen a paper randomly, but most of the time I want to concentrate in section B and C. But I just want to guide you in one or two questions in section A. So I've chosen last sittings paper. So I've chosen July, July. So if you have that paper, you can just look at it. July 2020, July 2022, or July stroke, August 2022 paper. So we said that in section A, in section A, the examiner is only interested in your answer, nothing else, only your answer. So we'll have solution to the questions this side. The examiner is only interested in your answer. I believe now the screen is bigger, you can see. Is the screen big enough? Ag August 2022. I think the exam was done on 28th Ju July for the August sitting. The exam was done in 28th what? July. 28th July. Okay. I hope the screen is now big enough. Okay, so if the big screen is big enough, we can now start. Remember, I've said this is just a guide because questions in section A cannot be repeated. 
But this is just a guide how to answer, and then we move on. Especially on the calculation part. Theory part cannot be repeated. They can test another one. So the question read question number one. This is section A, which has got 10 questions, 20 marks. The following statements have been made for the reliability of data. Remember, I've said I'm just guiding you. And then we go to section B and C, which will be the focus of our revision. So the following statements have been made for the reliability of data. Remember, data that is collected should be reliable. Information is reliable if it is from the right source. Information is reliable if it is free from biasness and errors, and it is also complete. So the following has been made for the reliability of data. So the question is asking you, which of the above statements are correct? Statement number one. Remember this is from chapter two. Sorry, from chapter one, chapter one. Data on government's website are free, are reliable primary data. Data from government websites are not primary data. They are secondary what? Data. So that is why that statement was wrong. Sometimes they are free. Sometimes you can pay for, but most of the data of the government is free, but it is from secondary what? Data. So point one is wrong because they use the word primary instead of secondary. Point two, an organization can never rely on secondary data as they are prone to significant errors. That is not true. An organization relies on both primary and secondary data. An organization relies on both primary and secondary data. Point number three, all externally obtained data are primary data. All externally obtained data are primary data. No, that is also wrong. All externally obtained data can be both primary and secondary. All externally, for example, if you obtain data from National Statistics of Rwanda, that is external data, but that is secondary data, not primary data. Point number four, qualitative data, qualitative data can only be collected as primary data, while quantitative data can only be collected as secondary data. That is also false. Qualitative data can be collected as both primary and secondary, and quantitative data can also be collected as both primary and secondary. So there was no answer that was right there. So question number one, the answer is D. Why is D the answer? You just write the answer. Don't do any other thing. You just write the answer. You can do your workings in the question paper. You can do your working in the question paper for section A. So what? why have I chosen D? D, the answer stated, none of the above. All the four points were wrong. Question number two. It reads two. Question two reads. Which of the following statements is true for responsibility centers? Remember, we have four responsibility centers. In revision, we are assuming you have already read. I'm just guiding you in revising. So we are assuming reading is not a problem. You have already done the reading. We are just revising. So which of the following statements is true for responsibility centers? Remember in responsibility centers, these are centers whose managers, whose managers are responsible for their performance. Centers whose managers are responsible for their performance. We have four responsibility centers. The first center is called cost center, cost center. The second center is known as revenue center. The third center is known as profit center. And the last center is known as investment center. 
So we have four types of centers, responsibility centers. I'm repeating cost center, revenue center, profit center, and investment center. What is a cost center? A cost center is a center which only incurs costs. Only the manager is responsible for the costs incurred in such a center. What is a revenue center? A center where only income is earned. You only earn income in such a center. Such a center is called revenue center. We also have a center known as profit center. Profit center is a center in which a center in which both costs are incurred and revenue is also earned. We earn revenue in that center. So it's a center in which costs are incurred and also revenue is earned. Last center is known as investment center. Investment center is a profit center in which also investment decisions are made in such a center. Profit center is a profit center in which investment decisions are also made in such a center. So what is the answer? What is the question? Which of the following statements is true about responsibility what? Centers. Statement number one, under investment centers, managers are responsible for investments and cannot be held accountable for costs. That is not true. An investment center, the first point, it is a profit center. But on top of it being a profit center, investment decisions are also made. So in an investment center, it is also a cost center. It is also a revenue center because it is a profit center. A profit center is a center in which costs are incurred and also revenue is earned. Okay, let's move on. Costs are incurred, but also revenue is earned. That is called a it's called a profit center. So an investment center, number one, it's a profit center. But apart from it being a profit center, investment decisions are also made in that particular center. Number two, B, so A is wrong. B, non-controllable costs are not a, directly, a direct responsibility of managers under investment centers, but rather the managers under cost centers. I'm repeating. Non-controllable costs are costs not within the control of managers. Those are what we call non-controllable costs. Are costs not within the control of managers, non-controllable costs, okay? Non-controllable costs are not a direct responsibility of managers under investment center, but rather the managers under a cost center. That is wrong. Non-controllable costs are still within the control of, sorry, are, are not within the control of cost centers because they cannot be controlled by the managers. They are not within control of the organization. They are not within the control of what? Post center managers. So that, that is wrong because it is saying, but rather that of managers under cost center. It is saying that non controllable costs are under control of cost managers. That is not right. C, cost center manager can be held accountable for the sudden increase in costs of power independently allocated to different cost centers by the group's chief executive officer. That is not right. If the CFO allocates some costs to them, to that center, they will not be responsible for such costs because 
those costs were just allocated to them. D, the main responsibility of managers under profit centers are to manage and control only costs and revenues. That is true. The responsibility of a profit center manager is to manage costs incurred and also revenue and so I was just guiding you on how to answer the question. So in that question, you should come and now choose that B is your, sorry, D. D is your answer. So I'll skip the remaining theory question. You can revise them so that I concentrate on calculations because theory questions can never be repeated. So which means they can still set another question. Every exam paper is original. They try to be as original as possible. But computation can be calculated, can be repeated, but using a different, different figures. So let's go to question three. Why have I chosen question three? Not question three, question four. I've chosen question four to be attempt next. Question number four to attempt because it's calculation. I hope we are together. Inamico Limited has budgeted the following for the next year, 2023. Given that, I've skipped those points. Given that K Limited produces and sells one product, which requires six kgs of materials, which of the following is budgeted which of the following is budgeted material patches in kgs for the year 2023 so what the question is asking you it is asking you for material purchase budget that is what the question is asking you material purchase budget that is what the question is I'll call it MPB. Of course, in kgs. The question has asked you in kgs. You should by now have read on how do we prepare material purchase budget. So material purchase budget in kgs, take note, I'm trying to be slow here, is equals to materials usage budget budget minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. I'm repeating. Material purchase budget is equals to materials usage budget minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. So that is materials purchase budget. But we have used the term materials usage, usage budget, which of course is also measured in kgs. Materials usage budget, it is equals to production Production units times quantity per, per unit. Materials usage budget is equals to production units times quantity per unit is equals to production units times quantity per unit materials usage budget is equals to production units times quantity per unit production units times quantity per unit if you have not been given production units you can also people have raised their hands if you have a question please just type in the question and answers i'll respond to it you just type your question in the question and answers. 
if I give everyone the right to unmute, we may not manage our class effectively. Let me see. But if you have a question, I can still allow you to talk. Theonesty. Can you unmute her talk, Theonesty? You have a question, Theonesty? I don't have a query. You raised no your question. Hand. Okay. Who else? Jean Baptiste, I've allowed you to talk. So please don't raise your hand if you don't have a question because it brings. Okay, please, you can mute now a question. Okay, so I was saying that materials purchase budget is materials usage budget minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. Materials usage budget is production units times quantity per unit. Production units times quantity per unit. Production budget or production units. Please, can we mute? The people are unmuted. Who is that? Who is that who was unmuted? The people are allowed, are allowed to talk. Okay. I'll, I'll allow everyone to talk. Let me allow everyone to talk, but you only unmute if you have a question. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm giving everyone the right to talk, but you only unmute if you have a question. Just give me a minute to allow everyone. I don't have full host rights, so just be patient with me. Okay, I think I've allowed only one. But please don't misuse the opportunity to ask a question. Don't misuse it. You only unmute if you have a question. So let's continue. Production units. Production units. Now, Production units, if you have not been given, it is normally sales units. Oh, 
now. I said, don't misuse the opportunity I've given you. So if somebody misuses, I switch you permanently. Okay. I hope those are the rules we, we agreed. I switch you, you only ask a question through question and answers if you misuse the opportunity. So production units is sales units minus opening opening inventory units plus closing inventory units. That is production budget or production units. So the, all these formulas, you are to apply them in that question. Remember, you don't need to write for the examiner these formulas because it is section A. The examiner is only interested in the answer. I only did that because I'm, in, I'm explaining, I'm revising. So we need to start with, therefore, production, production units because it was not given in the question. So question three, sorry, question four. What are our production? What are our production units? We get it as sales units. So look at this. Plant sale units, 20,000. Plant opening inventory, 5,000. And plant closing inventory, 4,000. So 25 and four. So production units is equals to 20,000, which is the production, which is the sales units minus opening 5,000 plus, pardon? No question, we continue. So opening plant sales units is 20,000. Opening inventory is 5,000. And closing inventory units is 4,000. So we have production units is equal to that. If you misbehave, I mute you permanently. Okay, so production units is 20,000 sales units minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. This is found in which topic? The topic of budgeting. So that gives you, it gives you is equals to, so we are saying 20,000 minus 5,000 plus 4,000. So what do we get? 19,000 units. 19,000 units as our production. So with that, we are now in a position to get materials usage budget. In materials usage budget, we said it's equals to production units times quantity per unit. So production units is 19,000 units times the quantity per unit, we go back to the question. The quantity per unit, given that K Limited produces and sells one product which requires 6 kg of material. So the quantity per unit is 6 kgs. So this will give you, therefore, a total of 19,000 times six. So it gives you one fourteen thousand kgs. That is materials usage. Finally, materials purchase budget in kgs is equals to, we said it is materials usage budget kgs minus opening inventory of raw material and closing inventory of raw material. So plant opening inventory of materials, materials is 60,000 
and closing inventory is 70. 60 and 70. 60 and 70. So we have here 60,000 kgs plus 70,000 kgs. So whatever value you get, you can get a certain value. Whatever value you get there is equals to that minus 60,000 plus 70,000. So what do we get? 124 kgs. 124,000 kgs. So please, this was in the chapter budgeting. So in short, we have revised functional budgets. And which functional budgets? We have revised material purchase budget and our answer is 124. Remember materials purchase budget is material usage budget minus opening inventory of materials plus closing inventory. Material usage budget is production units times quantity per unit. Production units is sales units minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. ICPA will share with you this Excel sheet. So we have found our answer as 124. Let's check the answers. Do we have any 124? Yes, answer is C. C is the answer. So question four, answer is C. Answer is C. If question five is theory, we do it. If it's not theory, we skip it. Is it theory? Yes. Question five is theory. Let's do it. I'm covering theory because they, are, they can be set in all sections. But before I go to that theory question, I'm trying to exhaust other types of budgets. So which budgets have we looked at? We have looked at number one, material purchase budget. Number two, we have looked at material usage budget. And even we have looked at number three. We have looked at number three, which budget? We have looked at production budget. What we have not looked at is sales budget because it was not there in this question. But let me just explain and then I move on. So in a sales budget, suppose we are selling chairs and we are selling tables. And then you will have the total of the chairs and the tables. You will identify your sales units, sales units of chairs, sales units of tables, and you add the two to give you the total sales units. And then you come and multiply sales units by selling price selling price per unit of chairs you find what is the selling price per unit of chairs what is the selling price per unit of tables but there you don't put any figure under the total you cannot add selling prices so the answer you get here gives you the sales budget or sales value so sales value will be in, of course, money form. The answer you get is sales value. So, of course, it's multiplication of those figures. So you'll take your sales units of chairs times selling price per unit. You will also take sales units of tables times selling price per unit and then you add these two to give you the total sales budget these two to give you the total sales budget so that is how a sales budget is prepared again i've said ICPA will share with you this there you can also be asked to prepare a labor labor budget and even in your labor you can be having two types of labor. You can be having skilled labor and you can have maybe semi-skilled semi, semi, -skilled, semi -skilled labor. 
This is just an example. You can have skilled and semi-skilled. Skilled and semi-skilled. Now, you will have to find out for the products you are making. Maybe you are making product A. You will have to find out what are the total hours for A. So here, you will take what? Production units times hours per unit. I'm just guiding you even in what was not asked in that question. I hope the guidance is okay. So semi skilled. And then you'll repeat the same also here. Production, production units times hours per uh, hours per unit. You get that again for semi skilled. Maybe product A. And then maybe you have another product. Product B you are making. You repeat the same. Production units of B times hours per unit. Times hours per unit. You get that. You also get it there. And then now you get your total labor hours. So the total labor hours for skilled and the total labor hours for semi, semi-skilled. The total labor hours for skilled. What have I done? Okay. The total labor hours for skilled and the total labor hours for semi-skilled. And then you come and multiply by the rate per hour. Rate per hour, which you'll be given there. Rate per hour, you'll be given rate per hour for skilled and rate per hour for semi-skilled. So this will give you total labor budget in money form. So those are at least four functional budgets, which we have revised when covering that question. So what have we covered? Sales budget, production budget, materials usage budget, and materials purchase budget. So that was question number four, which has enabled us to revise on functional budgets. Question number five. Question number five, let's read about it. Which topic, first of all, is it from? D, Rimari. So we are going to question number five. D, Rimari is a casual worker employed by a company under a piecework system of remuneration. Under a piecework system of remuneration. A piecework is paid at a rate of 13,000 per standard hour, and only nine minutes is set and allowed as the standard time for a unit of output. Any employee is guaranteed a minimum pay of 2,000 per hour worked. Normal working hours per day are as are eight hours. Now you are being asked, how much Girimari will be paid for eight hours and 130 units produced? So eight hours in 130, okay, in eight hours, they produced 130 units. Now this is a question from S1.2. Remember, in management accounting, S2, S3, 2, you are told the prerequisite is S1, 2, principles of costing, and S2, 2, managing costs and cash flows. This question is an extract of S1, 2, principles of 
costing and specifically a topic called labor a topic called labor so it is assumed that all units related to management accounting in stage two and stage one you know them that is the assumption and that is why you are given exemptions you will now know the reason why you are given exemptions for those who are given exemptions for those who are not given you cover them now the question let me read it once more girimari is a casual worker employed by a company under a piecework system of remuneration a piecework is paid at a rate of 13000 per a piecework is paid at a rate of 13000 per standard hour and only 9 minutes is set so there is a piecework what is we have two remuneration methods either time based where you are being paid for the time or piecework where you are being paid for the units i'm repeating time based or piecework time based you are being paid for the hours worked piecework for the units produced so a piecework is paid at a rate of 13000 per standard hour and only 9 minutes is set and allowed as the standard time for a unit of output so the standard time for a unit of output is 9 minutes any employee is guaranteed a minimum of 2000 hour per hour worked normal working hours per day are eight hours how much will be paid for eight hours and 130 units so in other words there are some calculations we need to calculate first what is minimum wage minimum wage you have been told the minimum wage in this question you have been told any employee is guaranteed a minimum wage of 2000 per hour worked and they worked for how many hours eight hours so 2000 per hour so our minimum wage is 2000 times eight hours so our minimum wage in this question is 2000 times eight what is the meaning of this if we get uh, the final answer less than 16000 for example if our answer gives us 15000 you will choose 16000 because 16000 is the guaranteed it is the minimum wage you can receive so if you work for less than 16000 you will receive 16000 but if you work for more than 16000 you will receive what you work for remember i'm covering multiple topics at the same time when i'm revising section a now you see c c could have been the answer if the final answer you got was less than 16000 so but we don't know if c is the answer or not so let's continue with the question the question continues to give you a piece work is paid at a rate of 13000 per standard hour and only 9 minutes is set and allowed as the standard time for a unit one unit the standard time is 9 minutes how many units have we produced 130 so standard time standard time allowed in minutes is equals to standard time allowed in minutes is equals to 9 minutes times 9 minutes times 130 units 9 
minutes times 130 units. So what does it give us? It gives us nine times 130. So it gives you 1170 minutes. But the payment was not per minute, was not in minutes. The payment was in hours. So we need to convert the standard time in minutes to standard time allowed to work in hours. Standard time allowed to work in hours. It will be 1170 divided by 60. So what is the standard time allowed to work? It is 1170 divided by 60. When you convert minutes into hours. So it is 19.5 hours. So what is the pay worked for? Pay worked for. What pay did these guys work for? What was the standard pay? What was the standard pay? I hope you have this question paper. A piece work is paid at a rate of 13,000 per standard hour. At a rate of 13,000 per standard hour. So pay worked for will be Rwandese francs 13,000 per hour times the number of hours, 19.5. So how much will that be? That will give you 13,000 times 19.5. It gives you 253,500. Now, what was the minimum wage? 16,000. What did this person work for? He worked for 253. How much will he receive? He worked for more than the minimum. So he, he will receive what he worked for. But if this amount, if that amount happened to have been less than the minimum, he could have received 16. If this was maybe 15,000, he could have received 16. So what will he receive? He will receive 253,500. Because he exceeded the minimum wage. Do we have 253? Yes. Question five, answer is B. Where is this? Question five, your answer is B. Remember, I'm explaining that is why I'm taking time. Because we are revising at the same time. Is there any other calculation question? Yes, question seven. Is there any other after that? Only question seven as calculation. Theories, it's difficult for them to, to rewind, to repeat, but just revise them just in case. Just in case they have decided to. So question, I said question number, is it seven? Question number seven. So what does question number seven ask you? Comesa Limited has a standard profit on actual sales of, of, 830,000 for a year for the year 2021. During the same period, the company has also recorded an adverse sales volume variance of 80,000. Now, where is it? 80,000, a favorable sales price variance of 40,000 and an adverse total cost variance of 9, 10,000. Which of the below is a fixed budgeted profit for the year? Fixed budgeted profit for the year. Now, first of all, you have been given, okay, the, uh, allow me to take time here. In short, here you apply the concept of operating operating statement in variances 
So you operate the concept of operating statement in variances. Now in operating statement, we normally have, allow me to take time here because I'm covering two topics in one. Just be patient with me here. Operating statement. An operating statement normally starts with budgeted profit. Normally starts with budgeted profit. Normally starts with budgeted profit. Now, standard profit on actual sales is only after accounting. So you get your budgeted profit there. And then you next come and account for sales volume. Volume. I hope you know the format of an operating statement, variance. So under the sales volume variance, if F, let me write here, if F add and if A, you less. What is F? F is favorable. So if F, you add. If A, you less adverse. What you get there is standard profit on actual sales. Standard, or let me use the word budgeted. Budgeted profit on actual sales. The answer you get, let's assume here you either add or you minus, depending on what the variance is. There is a reason why I'm slow here. I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. So I have there. That is called budgeted profit on actual sales. Okay, let's continue. This is an operating statement. And then you account for sales price variance, if there is any. So sales price variance, you account for it. If favorable, you add. If adverse, you minus. So again, I repeat that. Copy and I come and paste it there. Now what we get here is profit after all sales variances. Profit after all your sales variances, the answer you get there. And then once you have got there, you now come and account for all your cost variances. Account for all your cost variances. All cost variances are now accounted for here. I've said I'm trying to be slow here so that it sinks. You have favorable, favorable variances there and adverse variances there in those inner columns. So you start with material price variance. I'm assuming it is adverse. If it is adverse, I post it there. I'm just assuming, I don't know. Material usage variance. I'm assuming it is favorable. I post it there. Next, labor rate variance. I'm assuming it is maybe, let's choose which one. Let's assume it's favorable. Next, we have labor efficiency variance. Labor efficiency variance let's maybe post it there next we have variable overhead expenditure variance i'm assuming it is maybe adverse next we have variable 
let me use abbreviation here to use a lesser space. Variable overhead, okay? So let me have here variable overhead efficiency. In short, I'm trying to list for you all variances that you should practice. All variances you should know. In short, that is what I'm trying to do in short. Next, fixed overhead expenditure variance. I'm assuming it is X, it is A, F. And finally, fixed overhead volume variance. I'm assuming it is A. So once you have done that, you now come and get the total cost variances. Total cost variances. The totals are these. You add whatever was there. And also here, you add what is, what have I done? You add what is there. So you also get that. And then you compare the difference between the total of the favorable and the total of the adverse. You compare the two. You bring the difference there. If favorable, you add. If adverse, you less. So we have said if the total is, if F add and if A, you less. The answer you get normally gives you what you call actual profit. So this is what is called an operating, operating statement. And to be specific, it is an operating statement using absorption costing, but I don't have time to explain the difference. Now, this is called an operating statement. So which means you should know the formula of sales volume variance. You should know the formula of sales volume variance. You should know the formula of sales price variance. You should know the formula of all these variances, of all those. Let's hope on Thursday, we will look at questions on variances on Thursday, not today. Today, there are other topics we want to cover. I've just mentioned that because we have covered that question. Now, what has the question given you? Now, let's read once more. Giri Mari is a casual worker employed by a company and a piecework system of, sorry, not, not that, sorry. <laughs> the person who has raised his hand, you can ask your question. I was on question number seven, sorry. Comesa Limited has a standard profit on actual sales of 830,000. Standard profit, standard is the same as budgeted. Of how much? 830,000. Standard profit on actual sales of 830,000. Now look at where that 830. So here, there is where we have our 830. Do we agree? So let me put it here. It's supposed to be there, there, there. But let me just write it there, 830,000. So you have been given that answer, 830,000. I hope we are together. So I'm posting it in the right place. So next, you are being given question number seven. During the same period, the company had recorded an adverse sales volume variance of 80,000. Adverse sales volume variance. It is very important to follow what I'm doing. Adverse sales volume 
variance. Can I remove that? I put there 80,000. Is that 80? Let me copy this. I come and paste it after that 80,000. I'm just answering the question. Okay. Let's continue with the question. Question seven next. During the same period, the company had recorded an adverse sales volume variance of 80,000 and a favorable sales price variance of, of 40,000. A favorable sales price variance of 40,000. Sales price variance. Look at here, 40,000. We were told this is F. You are told this is A. Remember, if F you, you know what to do. If F you, whatever we had learned. Let's continue. Question number seven. And an adverse total cost variance of 910. Adverse total cost variance of 910. Adverse total cost variance of 900 and, you see there, 910. Adverse. Please note, what have I done? Please note that the question is either asking you for budgeted profit or the question is asking you for actual profit. That is the question you are being asked. If, can somebody volunteer and answer me? If you are asked for actual profit, what will you do? If you are asked for actual profit, what will you do? If you are asked for actual profit, what will you do? You will first of all get profit after all sales variances. You take 830 plus 40. Why do we add 40? Because it is favorable. It gives you 870. And then actual profit will be 870 minus 9. 10. So it has given you a loss. So the business made a loss. That one, if you are asked for this. But if you have been asked for budgeted profit, you work backwards. You take 830. Remember, adverse was being subtracted from budgeted profit. So what do you do? You add it back. Why do you add it back? Look at what I'm trying to do. You are given 9, 830. But 830 is a result of this plus minus that to give you 830. So if we are to work backwards going up, going up, if adverse was being deducted, when going back, we do what? Add it. I hope you get the logic. So what has the question asked you? What has the question asked you? Which of the below is a fixed budgeted profit? Budgeted profit, budgeted profit. Which one have we been asked? Is it the top one or the bottom one? Can somebody unmute and answer me? What have we been asked? Top or the bottom? Just unmute if you have a response. I have asked the bottom. What is bottom? What is bottom? What do you read here? It is an actual profit. What do we have here? Budgeted profit. And this is actual. Read the question again. You have not understood the question. 
The question has asked you, which of the below is the fixed budgeted profit? Budgeted profit, budgeted profit. Have you been asked the top or the bottom? Is it the top? The top. What is your answer? It is 910,000. 10, 910,000. Do we have an answer like that? Yes. B. B is the answer. What am I trying to say? Even the examiner's answers are not very clear. If you can master this format, it will help you to answer such questions. What do you need to master? You need to master an operating statement. So answer is B. B is 910,000. I hope we are together. I don't need to write it there. So this is the answer, 910,000. That brings us to the end of section A. That brings us to the end of section A. Can we now move to section B and C questions? Section B and C questions. Take note that I now want to revise the major topics randomly. Major topics randomly, depending on frequency of questions from that table in the PowerPoint. Remember that table that I gave you the analysis in which year was which topic tested? if you remember that table. So the remaining part, I now want to answer questions randomly. Randomly, that is the key point. Now, as we go to section C, sorry, section, the remaining parts, I want to cover the following topics between now and Thursday. I want to cover budgeting. And in budgeting, I look at flexed budget. I look at cash budget. Remember, in section A, have you agreed in section A we had already looked at functional budgets? Did we cover functional budgets? These ones here. Do we agree? I hope so. We have already covered functional budgets from section A. And I even covered what was not even in the question. That's why we had excess. If you are raising your hand, ask your question. Now, the budgets, so the topics I want us to concentrate on now is, I'll look at, please, you can note them somewhere so that you'll also remind me on Thursday. We will look at budgeting, how to prepare a cash budget and how to prepare a flexed budget. Number two, we look at limiting factors. Limiting factors is was not tested last sitting. So there is a very high chance of limiting factors being tested this sitting. So we'll also look at limiting factors. In, it's in the topic decision-making. We will also look at activity-based costing. Activity-based costing. We will also look at variances. Variances, how to calculate all these individual variances how to calculate all those individual variances. We will also look at performance measurement, both financial performance measurement and non-financial performance. Let me look to be covered so that I don't lose track, to be covered. So you'll just remind me, what do we go to next? To be covered, in section B. If you have a question, you can unmute. I'm seeing people raising their hands. So what will we cover in section B and C? We have said number one, budgeting. Now in budgeting, what will I cover in budgeting? I've said I'll cover cash budget. I will cover flex, flexible stroke, also called flexed budget. But in your case, I also want you to remember how to 
look at okay i'll explain that later on okay chapter so these ones are the ones i will cover so in flexed budget i'll look at a question in cash budget i'll look at cash budget i'm trying to look for a cash budget question did i really get a cash budget question normally i choose the questions in do you see cash budget question okay sorry let me move this okay cash budget is december 2020 question 2 december 2020 so in cash budget you will open december december 2020 question 2 is what i want to focus on on flexible budget you will also look at december 2020 question Thirteen A. Thirteen A. This is not question two. It is question twelve. Question twelve because it's section B and C. We will also look at that is under budgeting. I'll also look at variances. Now under variances, but I'll not cover it as chapter two. I look at number two. What did I say? Number two, decision making. And I'll focus on limiting factors. Limiting factors under decision making. Now, under limiting factors, I look at April 2021, question 15. April 2021, question 15. So that is under decision making. Number three, I'll also look at activity, VT based costing, and maybe AC and AC. Now, under activity based costing, I'll look at December 2020, question 15 under activity-based costing. Number four, I look at variances. So all and under variances, sales price variance, I look at sales volume variance, I look at material price variance, I look at material usage variance. I look at labor rate variance. I will look at labor efficiency variance. I look at variable overhead ex uh, expenditure variance. I look at variable overhead efficiency variance i look at fixed overhead expenditure variance and finally and fixed overhead volume variance so those are the variances we will concentrate on please only raise your hand if you have a question i'm seeing people raising their hands you are interfering Next, we have, we will also look at performance measurement. Now, I'll be covering these topics through questions, through past paper questions. Performance measurement. Now, under performance measurement, I will look at financial performance measurement measures using ratios financial performance measures using ratios now under ratios i will cover december 2021 question number 14 and hello 
I'm not hearing what you are saying. What are you saying? Okay. Non financial performance measurement measures. And in non financial performance measures, we will look at balance score card. Balance score card. Balance score card. We will look at balance score card. Balance score card is a very common non financial performance measure. So here we look at December 2020, question 14. Next, we will look at regression analysis under cost ST measure. Last time, I think they said ILO method. So here we will look at, it is not on performance measurement. Number six, we will look at regression, post estimation, sorry, post ST measure, and we will focus on We will focus on regression analysis. I hope you know how to cover high law method. So under regression analysis, I've still not identified the question we will do. So that is what we want to cover. Those are the major topics which I want to focus our revision on. Budgeting, decision making, Activity based costing variances performance measurement and cost st measure a question from each of those areas. So let's have our last break for 10 minutes, and then when we come, we will continue until 9 p.m. So when we come, we will start with budgeting and decision making at least these two no 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 we cannot finish the two maybe cash budget and flexible budget if we finish very fast we will go to limiting factors if we don't the next four hours my focus today was to cover section a questions and also to guide you on how to answer questions which i've already done so I'm now starting what I was to cover on Thursday because we have managed our time. So on Thursday, I was to cover this, but on Thursday, it's only four hours. We cannot cover everything in four hours. That is why I want to at least cover budgeting today and maybe decision-making if we have time. So 10 minutes break, don't log out, please. Don't log out. 10 minutes break, we resume at... Seven, seven, it's now 7.28, 7.38, 10 minutes break. Let me write here, 10 minutes break. Resume at, at seven, is it 7.40? 7.40, let's resume at 7.40 p.m. 10 minutes break. We resume at 7.40 p.m. I hope we are together. Maybe before we go to the break, is the revision okay so far? Is the revision good? Just unmute because we are now going for the break or you just answer. Are you okay with the coverage? Okay, fine. So let's go for the break and then when we resume, at 7.40, we now do a marathon until 9. Don't leave the meeting.
we can now resume. I hope most of you have access to past papers. So we'll be using past papers to Okay, fine. So let's, let's, we said we'll start with, you'll just be reminding me, we'll start with, what did we say? We'll start with budgeting, maybe cash budget and flexible. Maybe let me start with flexed budget and then I go to cash budget. So if you have your past papers, open December, 2020, December, 2020, question 13, December, 2020, question. 13, if you have your past papers, December 2020, question 13. I hope we are all back. December 2020, question 13. So let me increase the font. So this was part of question 13, which was on flexed budget alone. So December, December 2020, question 13, part A, part A, part A, it was on flexed budgets. It was on flexed budgets. Please, next time, what I advise you so that you see the screen very well, it's important to attend the class with a laptop. Phone, if you are using a phone, you'll really struggle a lot. So it's important to attend the class, have a laptop when attending an online class. It's important to have a laptop when attending an online class. So the question reads, the small soap company manufactures a soap that is made of natural products and does not involve the use of industrial produced chemical. The soap is made in batches of 100 bars. So the soap is made in batches of 100 bars and the financial year ended on 31st May, 2020. The company had budgeted to produce and sell 800 batches, batches of soap the company has prepared the following statement that compares the budgeted and actual results for the year given for the year. So there is the budgeted and there is the actual and then there is the variance. This is a small question, but it's a reflection of larger questions. So sales which are in batches, they had budgeted to make 800 batches of soap. Actually, they made 768. So there is the revenue, there is a variable production cost for materials, labor, and there is a fixed production costs. There is profit. The production manager has commenced, commented that the comparison of budgeted and actual is not valid as the actual volume of sales and production was not the same as the budgeted volume. So this production manager has said that this budget is not good because the budgeted volume was 800 and the actual was 768. So they are not the same. So required, prepare a new statement in the same format as above, which compares flexed budgets with the actual results, which compares flexed budget with the actual results. Now, I'm on flexed stroke flexible budget. Flex is also known as flexible budget. Now, maybe some working notes before we start. A fixed budget, a fixed budget, which we were not asked, it is what was given. What is given there is a fixed budget. A fixed budget. So I'll say given in the question, given 
in the question comma is a budget based on one activity level it's a budget that is based on one activity level a fixed budget is a budget that is based on one activity level it's a budget that is based on one activity level I just want everything to fit. Okay, a budget that is based on one activity level. A budget that is based on, that is a fixed budget. On the other hand, we have a flexible, Flexible stroke, flexed, flexed budget, which has been asked, which is the requirement, requirement is a budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity is a budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity now let's now answer the question the small soap company so our title will be small soap company flexed budget control statement a control statement is a statement that just shows your budget so you'll have here a budget actual results and and variance so we have our flexed budget budget we have our actual And we have our variance. That is what I want to do. Flex, actual, and variance. Flex, actual, and variance. So something like that. Variance we'll do later on. Now, what is a flex budget? A budget that is adjusted to reflect what? Actual activity a budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity and we are working in rwandese france thousands always ensure your work is presentable in exams so we'll start with revenue please be attentive on how we are doing because one question per area we don't have the time to cover two questions now, what we do is this. The revenue that was budgeted, you can see here, was 40,000. This 40,000 was based on a budget of 800. Now, we change this 40,000 to reflect a budget actual results. What is a flexed budget? A budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity. So, 40,000 was for 800 units. So, we change the 40,000 to reflect 768 units. So what will we do? You will take 40,000 times 768, because those are the new units, you divide everything by 800, which is the old budget. So we have 40,000. That is how you flex the budget. 40,000 was the original budget. Now we change the budget 
to reflect actual activity. This 40,000 was for 800. In high school, those who are in high school several years ago, there used to be a statement that if 800 units is equals to 40,000, if you recall that, what about, what about 768? What amount will it give you? So we used to do in high school cross multiplication. Cross multiplication. You used to take 768 times 40,000 divided by 800. That is what we have tried to do there. I hope it is clear. Now, so what is our answer here? We have 40,000 times 768, close the bracket, divide by 800. So it gives you an answer of 38,400. We are done with revenue. Next, we go to variable production costs. Variable production costs. And we have materials as the first variable. We have labor as the second variable. So we have materials and we have labor. So materials, you also say the same. Materials was 24,000. 24,000 was based on 800. So we adjust it to reflect 768. So it will be 24 times 768 divided by 800. So we'll have 24 times 768 divided by 800. You get your materials so 24000 times 768 divided by 800 so what does it give you 23040 23040 we repeat the same for labor labor will be 1200 times 768 Divide by 800. So labor will be seven, sorry, 1,200 times 768, close the bracket, divide by 800. It gives you 11. Next, fixed production. Cost. What is fixed cost? Fixed cost does not change. Does not change. So you don't adjust. Fixed cost does not change. So we have 7,000. And then we will have our profit. So what will be our profit? Our profit will be 38,000 minus 23. Minus 1152 minus 7000. So, what does it give you? 7208. 7208. 7208. Actual remains the same. So, our actual here was 38400. You can see here 38400. 100, 38, 400 was the actual. Here we had 25, 25, 285. We had 1,200. We had 
70, 50. And this was 38 minus 25 minus 1, 2 minus 750. It gives us a, a profit of a profit of that. So what is variance? Variance is now the difference between the budget and actual. So you, it's always advised, actually the, the, it's always advised to, to start with a bigger figure. So we have zero. So there is no variance in sales. Next here, it is always advisable to start with a bigger figure. Here there is a variance of, these are now costs. We had budgeted to have material cost of 23,040. We actually had more material costs. Therefore we lost. It is adverse because you had budgeted to spend 23,000 and you spent more. It is adverse. Let's look at labor costs. We had budgeted to spend to spend 11.52. We actually spent 1,200. We spent more. It is still adverse. Let's look at fixed production. We had budgeted to spend 7,000. We actually spent 7,500. It is still adverse because you actually spent more. Let's look at the profit. We had budgeted to have a profit of 7,200. We actually had a profit of less amount. Sorry, I'll put it in the wrong place. We had budgeted, we actually had that. So the answer is adverse. So all variances were adverse in the flexed budget. So what have we learned about flexed budget? A flexed budget is a budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity. A budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity. In a flexed budget, fixed costs are not adjusted. So remember, once you reach the fixed cost level, you don't adjust. If you have a question, you ask it in the question and answers. So that is flexed budget. So just be marking what we have covered. So I'm also ticking. We have covered flexed budgets. So I'll be marking in red. Or how can we? What we have covered, I mark in red. So next, we are going to a cash budget. Cash budget, December 2020, question 12. December 2020, question 12. We have covered flex. Flex is a budget that is adjusted to reflect actual activity. So let's go to a cash budget. December 2012. So I'll first of all increase the size so that I read the question. Once I've re read the question, I'll reduce the size. <laughs> so December 2020, question 12. December 2020, question 12. So the question reads, so we are looking at cash budget. Remember, cash budget is a budget that shows cash inflows, cash outflows, difference between cash inflows and cash outflows. I'm repeating. A cash budget is a budget that shows cash inflows, cash outflows, difference between cash inflows and cash outflows, which can either be a surplus or a deficit. And then you add opening cash balance. So if you add your opening cash balance to your closing cash balance, what you get is closing opening cash balance to surplus or deficit, what you get is closing cash budget. So let's read this question. Nadine is a wholesaler of a household products. 
She buys products from local producers and importers and sells them to retailers. I hope you can hear me because it is raining where I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, fine. So, okay, fine. Then let's let's continue because it's raining heavily where I am. But if you can hear me, it's good. Let me continue. Nadine is a wholesaler of household products. She buys products from local producers and importers and sells them to retailers. So Nadine is a wholesale, wholesaler of household. She buys products from local producers and importers and sells them to retailers. Retailers buy from Nadine on credit and pay two months later. Retailers buy from Nadine on credit and pay two months later. Budgeted sales for the last five months of the year 2020 are as follows. Budgeted sales for the last five months for the year 2020 are as follows. So we have our budgeted sales. Budgeted sales for the last, what, five months for the year 2020 follows. So we have our budgeted sales for August, 33 million, September, 37 million, October, 40 million, November, 38 million, and December, 27 million. All goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of 100%. What is markup? Markup is profit on cost. Markup is profit on cost. I'm repeating. All goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of 100%. Nadine always has enough inventory at the end of each month to satisfy 40% of the following month's sales. So Nadine always has Nadine always has enough inventory at end of each month to satisfy 40% of the following month's sale. So closing Closing stock for Nadine is what? 40% of next month's sales. So for example, closing stock in August is 40% of 37 million. That is the next month. Closing stock in September is 40% of 40 million, like that until the end. Suppliers are paid after one month. Suppliers are paid after one month. Employee costs and other costs, excluding depreciation, amount to 1.2 million per month. So employee costs and other costs, but this does not include depreciation, amount to 1.2 million per month. Nadine is planning to replace some machinery in the warehouse in October. It is expected that the old machinery will be sold for 50 million cash, which will be received in October. The new machinery will cost 300 million and will be paid in November. The new machinery will be depreciated over four years, which represents a monthly depreciation charge of 6.2 million per month. So depreciation is an uncash flow. I hope you remember that. Next, opening inventory on 1st September 2020 is expected to be 7.4 million. Opening cash balance on 1st October are expected to be 300 million. Opening cash balance on 1st October. 
So prepare monthly, prepare monthly cash budget for October, November, and December, which clearly shows the forecast cash balances at the end of each month. So Nadine cash budget. So I'll come here in our solution. I'll have to slightly reduce it. I've slightly reduced it. I hope you have the question somewhere. Solution. You know, when you are revising for exams, past papers is like your Bible now. You must have it. So the name of the company is Nadine Wholesaler Cash Budget for three months ended 31st December 2020. 2020. Now, we want to work in millions. We want to work in millions. So we want to work in millions. Can I just increase the size a bit? I've posted this in the wrong area. I'll copy and come and paste it there. So we have the month of October. We are only doing what we were told. October, November, and December. And then we were not told, but we can have total. So that is what we have. Now, what I'll be doing, I'll be going back and reading the question and post. So you start with cash inflows. Cash inflows. Inflows. There are two ways of preparing a cash budget. I will explain. So the major source of cash inflow is sales. So there was sales. And in sales, because sales, 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 were we given the rules of posting sales? All goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of that. Nadine always has enough inventory at the end of each month to satisfy 40% of the following month's sales. Suppliers are paid after one month. That is suppliers, not sales. Employees costs that, okay? Nadine is planning to replace some of the machinery of the warehouse. It is expected that the old machinery will be sold for 50 million which will be received in October. New machinery will cost 300 million. The new machinery will be depreciated that. Opening inventory has been given. Opening cash has been given. So prepare a monthly. So in sales, you have not been told if it is no. cash or credit. Sorry, sir. Yes. I have told us for the second paragraph, there is the retailers buy from Nadine and, and pay on credit after two months. Where is it? At the second paragraph of the question. Retailers. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Here. 
Retailers yeah. buy from Nadine on credit and pay what? Two months later. later. Thank, thank you. I didn't read that. Thank you for that. And pay two months. So August sales will be paid in October. So here we are receiving, we are posting when cash is received. When cash is received, not when the sales was made. So when cash is, so August sales will be received in October. So that is 33. Thank you for that. So after two months. So that's the key point there, after two months. So September sales is received 37, okay? October, sorry, I did not read this first paragraph. October will be received in December. October will be received in December. So it is 40. Now, there was an, another source of cash inflow. There was, it's planning to replace some machinery. So there was disposal of machine. If you remember, disposal of machine will give you a cash inflow. So we are being told Nadine is planning to replace some machinery in the warehouse. It is expected that the old machine will be sold for 50 million cash, which will be received in October. So October, 50 million. Now, there is no any other. You will see where I will post opening cash. Don't worry about opening cash. I said there are two ways of posting this. So what is the total cash inflow? Cash inflow is the money that came in. What is your total cash inflow? Your total cash inflow will get it. It will be equals to sales plus disposal. So that gives you 83. Okay, let's continue. So that is total cash inflow. Then once you have got your total cash inflow, you now go for your cash outflow. Cash outflow. There were quite a number of cash outflows. Freeze. Yes. What about the new machinery? In the paragraph, the new machinery will be the new machinery will cost three hundred million. Is that a cash inflow or a cash outflow? Is it cash yeah. outflow? Thank you. Cash outflow. We were posting cash inflows. I think I stressed that enough. We were posting cash inflow. That one which you have read is a cash what? Sorry, sir. Outflow. Yes. Before we move on, cash out flow. How about the markup profit that we gain on in sales? Sales has already been posted here. You don't need to mark it up. You will see where the markup comes, not here okay. in sales. Is that okay? okay. Sales, okay. it is already sales. It is already. Sales. Sure. Is that okay? Now let's yeah. read what you are saying. All goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of 100%. Are we together? Nadine always has enough inventory at the end. That statement enables you to know the purchases Nadine is a wholesaler. She buys products from local producers and importers. Purchase from what? Producers. Stroke importers. Do you get me? And I'll have a working for it because there are some calculations to be done. Whatever you are now talking about. Are we together? We will work them out. So purchase from producers, whatever you are talking of, we'll work it out there. Suppliers are paid after one month. We will work it out. 
employee costs. So there is employee costs. So employee costs and other costs, excluding which does not include depreciation, amount to 1.2 per month. So employee cost is 1.2 million per month. 1.2 million per month. 1.2 million per month in each of those three months. In each of those three months, it is 1.2 million per month i've posted that let's continue nadine is planning to replace some machinery in the warehouse in october it is expected that the whole machine will be sold for 50 we have already posted that which will be received in october we have already posted that the new machine will cost will cost what 300 and will be paid in november patches patches of machine so when we purchase machine it will be paid in november and it will cost as how much 300 million the new machine will be depreciated over four years Depreciation is a non-cash flow. You don't account for it. Depreciation is a non-cash flow. You don't account for it, which represents a monthly depreciation of 6.2 per month. We don't account for it. It is non-cash flow. Next, you are being told, opening inventory at first September 2020 is expected to be 7.4 million. Opening cash balance on 1st October 2020 are expected to be 300 million. Let's be very attentive now here. We are done with all cash outflows. So we will get total cash outflows. I'm just doing that so that I'm in a position to underline. So we want to look at total cash outflow. We still don't have it because purchases is missing. Next, we need to get surplus stroke deficit. Deficit is when it is negative. When the inflows are less than the outflows, there will be a deficit and then you add opening cash balance opening cash balance what you get is closing closing cash balance what results you get is closing cash balance so let's read the last sentence Opening cash balance at 1st October are expected to be 300 million. Opening cash balance on 1st October is expected to be what? 300 million. I hope you have seen that. Now, we have everything we need in order to answer the question apart from working. So let's look at what we need. So that is what we need to complete the question. What is now missing is our working. Workings. And our working one, what we are interested in knowing is purchase from purchase from producers and importers. Importers. That is what we want to find out. Purchase from producers, stroke, importers. So I want to list all months. I'll start with August. I'll go to September. I'll go to 
October, I'll go to November, I'll go to December. Now, I want to start with closing I want to start with, okay, let me post the sales first. What are our sales in each month? Our sales are 33, 37, 40, 33, 37, 40, 38 and 27, 38 and 27. I believe we all agree that is sales. Now you are being told all goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of 100%. So markup is profit on, markup is profit on cost, which is equal to 100%. I hope you know that from S31, S31, we are applying S31 there. Margin, we do, please note what I'm writing there. We do not have costs and therefore we need to convert Mark up, mark up to margin. Margin is profit on sales. Margin is profit on sales. Margin is profit on sales just allow me to okay margin is profit on sales how do we convert anybody who can volunteer and answer me if markup if markup anybody who can volunteer is yeah. is a hundred percent comma margin will be what will be margin Anybody to help me? You just unmute and talk if you have the answer. Margin, if you don't have, let me do it. Margin is, you take the markup, markup is 100%. 100% means it's 100 over 100. Sorry. Margin will be a hundred. Let me put it this way. Sorry for that. We were given markup, markup, which is equals to markup is equals to a hundred divided by a hundred. Markup. What will I do there? If I want all figures to appear there. What should I do? Markup will be 100 over 100. I think that is better. 100 over 100. Margin, margin will be, will be, I think this is better to put it that way, will be 100. That's a 25. Yes. Over 100 plus 100. When converting markup to margin, we add the numerator. This numerator, this denominator. 100% is the same as 100 over 100. So you add, when converting, I'm repeating. When converting markup to margin, you take the numerator, you add it to the denominator. So that will give you, a hundred over a 
100 plus 100. So that gives you, what will be the margin? Margin is that, which is equals to divide by that, what does it give you? As a percentage, it gives you what? 50%. Margin is therefore 50%. Now, let's go back to that statement. All goods are sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of 100%. At a markup of a hundred percent. So we need to find. Remember, sales is equals to cost plus profit. We need to get the profit. Profit is equals to fifty percent of sales profit is 50% of sales profit is 50% because of this because of that sorry because of that so 50% times sales so 17 that is profit that was made in each month. So are we in a position to get cost? Cost will be equals to sales minus profit. Of course, that is cost. So sales minus profit. So what will it be? And remember our months again. I'll copy that and paste it there so that you don't forget. Our months are those. So we already have the cost of cost of but now cost of production or purchases. But now there is another point here. Nadine always has enough inventory at the end of each month to satisfy 40% of the following month's sales. Suppliers are paid after one month. So do we need opening stock? Opening stock or opening inventory. I don't think we need it, but let me see. Inventory. And we have closing, closing inventory. We are just accounting for it, but I doubt whether we need it. So what is closing inventory? We are being told, Nadine always has enough inventory at the end of each month to satisfy 40% of the following month's sales. Suppliers are paid after one month. So at the end of each month. So closing inventory at the end of each month is 50%, sorry, 40% of the next month's sales. 40% of the next month's sales. Of the next month's sales. So what is the next month's sales? 40% times the next month. The next month's sales is that. So I'll drag that is 15. Should we use cost or should we use?
let me see this 40 percent of the next month's what sale but yes of the next month 37 so we have 15 i scroll that until the end in other words i've calculated this the september closing inventory is what 40 percent of the october the october closing inventory is that of november like that until the end but you are also told finally you are told opening inventory on first september is what 7.4 million opening inventory on first september is seven point have they seven say it's seven point four 7.4 years. Opening inventory is 7.4 million. So remember, closing inventory in September is the opening inventory in October. Opening like that. So we have that working. Now, we need to know purchases from even the topic budget is equals to sales please take note of that sales minus opening inventory inventory plus closing inventory i hope everyone is familiar with that purchases or production is sales closing inventory now what will be the purchases therefore purchases therefore will be look at what i'm doing carefully will be our sales but based on the cost here cost sorry 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 using excel is becoming a challenge look at these costs of sales so i want to know purchases purchases will be this minus opening plus closing so that will be the purchases i do that until the end i'm repeating purchases will be this minus opening plus closing have i done that yes let me repeat to confirm this minus opening plus closing so that gives you purchases as that i hope we are still together the last sentence you have been told the last sentence all goods sold by nadine are sold nadine always has enough inventory at the end blah blah suppliers are paid after one month so paid cash paid cash paid after one month suppliers are paid after which means this supplier will be paid in the next month this supplier will be paid in the next month that supplier will be paid in the next month like that that supplier will be paid in the next month like that that supplier will be paid in the next month so what will be our purchases? We now have it. What is the purchases in October? When were they paid? In October purchases will be 27, 19, and 15. So we have 27 like that, 19 and 15. And therefore the cash flow is now complete. We have that plus that plus that the cash flow is now complete 28 like that so 
what is the surplus or deficit? Look at this. The difference between cash inflow and cash outflow. It gives you 55. I'll do the same until the end there. In November, we have a deficit. Now, surplus plus opening cash gives you the closing cash. Closing cash in October is the opening cash in November. I hope you've understood that. Closing cash in October is the opening cash in November. You also get this negative that plus 355. What do we get? 71. Closing cash in November is the opening cash in December. And then we have 24 plus that. It gives you 96. And we can get the totals now. What are our totals? We get them up to there. So we have our cash budget. Any question on the cash budget? You can unmute if you have a question. You can unmute if you have a question. Yes, if you have raised your hand, just unmute and ask the question. I think I had given everybody permission to talk, apart from only those who are disturbing us. Let me see. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, sir. Yes, ask your question, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, uh, I'm on road to the, due to the connection. I, I don't see well how you can create the, the purchase. But you see now if, that one, that one now if it's connection, it's like, imagine if you are lost for 30 minutes. Will we go back for 30 minutes? Do you understand me? Otherwise, we'll not move forward. If your connection is lost, ICPA will provide you with the recording. Do you understand me? Because if your connection is lost, it means I must go back and explain everything. Okay, what are you asking? Yeah, it, it is on the, the how you you recreated the purchase. Purchases. When purchases from the topic budgeting, you know that purchases is sales minus opening inventory plus closing inventory. Yes. So purchases is, so I took the equivalent of sales after converting these. Remember, we were charging a markup. So after conversion, after conversion, that is the equivalent of sales. Do you agree with me? After removing the profit that was made, that is the equivalent of sales. After removing the profit. Opening inventory, I hope you knew. So I took these minus that plus that. How the conversion done? How is the conversion done? Which convention? Of inventory. I'm saying of inventory. What? If I go back there, now you see that's why I was saying that if it is about network connection, it means I'm now repeating everything and we are taking a lot of time. Now, inventory, you follow the rules you are given here. All goods sold by Nadine are sold at a markup of that. Nadine always has inventory, enough inventories at the end to satisfy 40% of the following month sales. So closing inventory yeah. is 40% of the next month sales. Yeah. Is that okay? okay. Opening okay. inventory is closing inventory of the previous month. Have mm -hmm. you understood? Yes. Okay, fine. So can we, I'm seeing we are remaining with only 20 minutes. Will we be in a position to do so? We are done with budgeting. In budgeting, so what have we covered in budgeting? We have covered functional budgets from section A. We have covered cash budget and we have covered fixed and flexed budgets. Please, now it is upon you to revise, revise, revise. Yeah, revision, okay. Okay, fine.
Fine. Yes, uh, Philippe. Do you have a question? No question. Okay. I was seeing in the question and answers. I'm just reading what is in the question and answers. Uh, Giselle, my screen is too small. No, it's, it's your gadget. I've put a full screen. So it's not too small. Maybe it's your, your gadget that is a problem. So on Thursday, make sure you try using, you try using, you try using what? A laptop to attend the class so that you can see the full screen. Now, I'm looking at the minutes remaining. Will it enable us to cover limiting factors? Maybe let's just introduce the question. We will continue with it next time so that at least we make use of the 19 minutes. Can we do something in 19 minutes even if we don't finish? And then we will continue on Thursday. Is that okay? Now, in the 19 minutes, let's work on the next topic, decision making. Decision making. Decision making, I've picked a question from April 2021, question 15. April, April 2021, question 15. Let me increase the size a bit. But if you have the past papers, it's good to read it from the past papers. Now, the question reads, where the time ends is where we will stop. Big Drill Limited manufactures drill parts for use in mining industry. The company makes three versions of its drill part as follows. Basic, standard, and super. You have been given the selling price, material cost, but labor hours. You have not been given the labor cost. You have been given the labor hours per unit. Maximum demand per week is also given. Labor is paid at a rate of 700 per hour. Variable overheads. We are in the topic decision making now. And in which subtopic? Limiting factors under decision making. Remember that. So labor is paid at a rate of 700 per hour. Variable overheads are incurred at a rate of 1,000. Variable overheads are incurred at a rate of 1,000 per hour. Due to shortage in labor with the appropriate skills, labor is limited to 11, 25 hours per week. Fixed overheads are 2 million, which are incurred each week. Part A of the question, calculate how many units of each product should be made per week in order to maximize profits and calculate the value of the profit per week. Now, part C, okay? So I want to concentrate on part A, but I will not finish it. First of all, even though we were not asked, I need you to know the steps followed. The steps followed, followed in finding the optimal production. We were not asked, but it is important. Production plan and total profit or contribution. Now, what is an optimal production plan? If you are read, you know that optimal production plan is the mix of products that we need to produce to maximize profits. The mix of products we need to produce to maximize profits. The mix of products we need to produce to maximize what? Profit. So what is step one? 
identify the limiting factor. So that will always be your step one. Limiting factor, limiting factor, we are revising, arises when the resources, resources needed are more than the resources available. Limiting factor normally arises when the resources needed are more than the resources available. That is step one. So if what is needed is more than what is available, there is a limiting factor. Step two. Step two is to calculate contribution per unit. If you follow these steps, you will always be right in any question on limiting factors. Just ensure you follow these steps strictly. So remember, contribution per unit is equals to selling price per unit minus variable costs per unit. Contribution per unit. I hope, I believe we are also sure of that. Variable cost per unit will be equals to direct materials, material cost plus direct labor cost plus variable overheads. Okay. Next, step three. Step three is to calculate contribution per unit of limiting factor. Con calculate contribution per unit of limiting factor. So contribution per unit of limiting factor is equals to contribution per unit divided by limiting factor per unit. The point I'm trying to do, these are the notes you need in order to answer the question. So I'm still focusing on the notes you need in order to answer the question appropriately. Step four, you need to rank, rank the products using the results. from step three. Rank the products using the results from step three. The product, the product with highest, highest contribution per unit of limiting factor is Ranked first. Step five. What is step five after ranking the products? Find, sorry, allocate, allocate, allocate the scarce resources to each product. So start by allocating, 
cars resources to the product ranked first. And then is when you move to the next product. So you start by allocating to the product ranked first. Step six, which is the final step. Find the optimal production plan and total contribution. Find the optimal production plan and total contribution. But here you are told profit. Total profit. Now, I have a feeling that we should stop, but there are still 10 minutes. So what we do, let me just highlight what we will do. I put the structure and then we will continue next time. So what you do, now we solve the question. So solution, solution to the question. In our solution today, please strictly follow the steps. Step one, identify the limiting factor. You just read what I've said up here and then you apply it. Limiting factor arises when the resources needed are more than the resources available. So let's look at labor hours available. Labor hours available. Were we given the labor hours available? I think so. Here, here. Labor is limited to 11.25. So labor hours available is 11.25 hours. Next, we need to find labor hours needed. Labor hours needed, what we need is equals to, look at this, for basic, we need two hours per unit. How many units are there? 200. For standard, we need 2.5, 250. For 100. So that is what I'm doing. So two hours times 200 units plus 2.5 hours times 250 units plus four hours times 100 units. So we get the answer. So let me do maybe the first one. This one will give you Okay. Two times two hundred plus into bracket two point five times two fifty. Close the bracket plus four times one hundred. Close the bracket. It gives you fourteen hours. Now, how many hours? Labor, labor is a limiting factor because we need 14.25 hours, but we only have 11.25 hours. We will therefore not make all the units, but choose the units to be made. We will not make all units, but rather choose the units to be made. Choose the units to be made. Now, step two where I want to stop is to 
calculate country fusion per unit. Now, we have which products? Basic, standard, and super. We have the products are basic. We have a product called standard. And we have a product called super. So what we will do, we will look at what is the selling price per unit. Selling price per unit. And then we will less variable costs per unit. And our variable cost per unit here, they are quite a number. Our variable cost per unit are many here. There is direct materials. So let me call it D material cost per unit. We will have direct labor cost per unit and we'll have variable overheads overhead cost per unit variable overhead cost per unit i want us to stop there and then here what we'll get country Fusion per unit. Please, before you join the Thursday class, all these Excel, I'll give you once I'm done. Before you join the Thursday class, let's all agree. Before you join the Thursday class, read this question again. April 2021, question number 15. That is where we will start from on Thursday. I have another meeting just immediately at nine. So I want us to stop there. Maybe random questions, you can just unmute the class. Okay, before that, uh, is there any ICPA official online? ICPA official online? I'm not seeing any ICPA official online. So, okay. Now, is there any comments? what we should improve on. How was the first class? How was the first revision? So next week, this week on Thursday, we are continuing at five. Please keep time and we will end at nine. Any comments? Maybe in the question and answers or you can unmute as we end the session. Any comments? Please, before you join that class, Read that question again. Yes, Felipe, you have raised your hand. What is your comment? Yes, the, the first thing is appreciate you for you because of we have opportunity to pass our, our this paper. Thank you so much for me. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Any other comment, feedback? You know, we only improve with feedbacks. Just, I'm seeing somebody, I don't want to go. Can you just unmute if you have raised your hand? Zinza? Or have I closed you out? Sorry. I have now allowed you to talk. Zinza? Huh? Have I really allowed you? Yes, I think I've allowed you. Zinza, talk. Vladin? I'm just looking at the people who have raised their hands. Vladin? Okay. If there is no any other comment, let's stop there. Mka001. Now, okay, Valentin? I'm, I'm allowing you to talk, Valentin? Please, please, sir. Yes. Please, 
if possible, you can share us those questions. Can I check with you? Thursday. Your network is bad. Just mute. I will share on Thursday immediately after the class. It's still a work in progress. Can yeah, I share our email? No, Ikpa will share with you. Ikpa will share with you. I'll send it to Ikpa and then they share with you. Is that okay? Through your emails. So let's stop there. Ikpa has access to your emails. They will share with you. Don't worry about that. Okay, fine. I think let's stop there. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bavan, mau buat apa? Tengok apa Hello. Yes. It's very nice. The presentation is good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You should now also read. Eh? Fine. Thank you. Let's stop there. We meet on Thursday.